What's up, my friend? Abby here, and welcome back to Writer's Life Wednesdays, where we come together to help you make your story matter and make your author dreams come true. This video is part two of the video I posted last week, which is all about how to write a negative character arc. We explored the negative character arc structure and looked at all of the plot points in detail. So if you missed that video, you'll wanna start there. In this video, we're going to case study two very different story examples and look at what the negative character arc looks like in action. Why does your story matter? Good question. What if I told you that there's a science behind every great story? I don't just teach you how to write. I teach you how to change the world with your story and make your author dreams come true. Okay, just to refresh what we went over last week, a positive character arc is for a character who goes on a transformative journey and ultimately discovers the truth, becoming a better person as a result. And a negative character arc is for a character who goes on a transformative journey and ultimately embraces a lie as the truth, becoming a worse person as a result or meeting their tragic end. The negative character arc consists of five main story beats. The conflicted starting point, the first fear-based choice, the game-changing midpoint, the acceptance of a lie, and the tragic end. You may have heard that there are three negative character arcs, the disillusionment, the corruption, and the fall, but as I explained in last week's video, they all fall under the same overarching structure. And bonus, this structure works perfectly with the three-act story structure, which I made a whole super detailed video series on Check that out here if you haven't seen that. All right, let's jump into the case studies. We're going to go over all of the story beats and ask ourselves the questions, the prompts that I gave you in the first video and uncover the answers. And the two negative character arc examples that we're going to analyze today are Loki from Thor and Elizabeth from Poldark. Told you they were completely different from each other, <laughs> but they're actually surprisingly similar and I'm gonna show you why. Spoiler alert, I'm about to reveal all of the major plot points in both of these stories, just so you know. Let's start by studying Loki's character arc in the film Thor. The conflicted starting point. What does Loki think will bring him true happiness or contentment? How is his desire fundamentally based on his misbelief? All Loki wants is to be king of Asgard, but not for the sake of the realm or its people only for the sake of proving himself worthy. Since he was a child, Loki felt threatened and eclipsed by his brother Thor, who has always been the favored son. All Loki ever wanted was to be Thor's equal, a reasonable desire which, over time, spirals into a delusional thirst for power and respect. When Thor is chosen to rule Asgard, Loki begins conspiring a way to dethrone him, while making it look like he himself is blameless and a far more responsible ruler than his belligerent brother. But everything changes when Loki makes a shocking discovery. He is not Odin's son after all, but the son of a frost giant. So I am no more than another stolen relic, locked up here until you might have use of me. Why'd you twist my words? You could have told me what I was from the beginning. Why didn't you? Not only does this revelation shatter Loki's world, it also feeds into his greatest misbelief, that he is different from everyone else, an outsider, a monster, not worthy to be king. This lie clashes perfectly with his desire for respect and power, setting up some great internal conflict for the next plot point. The first fear-based choice. What is the impossible choice? Loki must be faced with options, stay inside his comfort zone and risk never getting what he desires, or venture into the unknown and accomplish his goal while still avoiding his fear. By this point, we can see that Loki is done living in the shadows. With Thor banished to Earth and his father totally out of it, he is faced with a unique opportunity, the chance to take his place as king. It is everything he desires, but it also forces him outside his comfort zone, why? Because he is still grappling with his fear and misbelief. Even now, he feels threatened by Thor, and will do anything to cut him down to size. On the outside, Loki seems to be obsessed with himself, but on the inside, he struggles with insecurity and low self-esteem. He's afraid of not being accepted for who he truly is, so he goes to extreme lengths to prove himself worthy to be worshipped as the king of Asgard. This is what drives him to seize the throne and manipulate others into accepting his takeover. He is still avoiding his fear, but venturing into the unknown to get what he wants. All of us must stand together for the good of Asgard. 
His fear of being unworthy is the reason for his every decision going forward. It pushes him to take aggressive action to get what he thinks will make him happy, instead of making courageous decisions that would bring him closer to the truth. Game-changing midpoint. What unexpected thing is going to upend Loki's plan an entire life? Why does it matter, and how does it change the game? Remember how, in part one, I said the protagonist's game-changing midpoint may be instigated by the antagonist? That is exactly the case here. Thor's game-changing midpoint is the scene where Loki appears to him to tell him that their father is dead. It's not true, but Loki has no problem lying to anyone. And although he is the instigator of Thor's plot twist, it still matters to Loki because of his personal journey. This pivotal moment is important to both character arcs. Let me explain to father. Father is dead. What? Your banishment. The threat of a new war. It was too much for him to bear. Loki makes Thor believe that he is to blame for their father's death and their mother's heartbreak. He keeps up the facade of the sensible, sympathetic one who just wants to do the right thing, proving how far he'll go to get what he wants. Although this game-changing midpoint doesn't exactly upend Loki's life, it does mark a distinct moment in his downfall. When he lies to Thor and banishes him to Earth forever, we see that Loki has crossed the point of no return. He's on the warpath, and won't stop until he eliminates everything that threatens him. Acceptance of Lie What makes Loki embrace his lie once and for all? What dramatic action does he take to get what he wants? As Loki descends into corruption, he becomes more disdainful, envious, and desperate. He mistakenly believes that the world is against him, which makes him feel alienated and defensive. Still battling his own insecurities, he longs to be respected as the king of Asgard, not only in the eyes of its people, but in the eyes of his father. Which leads him to another pivotal decision, orchestrating Odin's assassination. I will conceal you, and a handful of your soldiers lead you into Odin's chambers and you can slay him where he lies. This is Loki's final and greatest attempt to accomplish his goal, a foolproof plan to win respect, power, and his own sense of self-worth in one fell swoop. Even now, we can see that Loki's lie still controls him. It's the driving force behind all his actions. Why have you done this? To prove to father that I am a worthy son. When he wakes, I will have saved his life. I will have destroyed that race of monsters, and I will be true heir to the throne." His toxic jealousy of Thor reaches a boiling point as he attempts to destroy his brother once and for all, which directly leads him to the tragic end. How has Loki's bad decisions led him to his tragic end? How is he to blame for this whole mess? Being the antagonist of the story, Loki is to blame for pretty much everything that goes wrong. But really, his lie is the true enemy. It internally destroys him and wreaks havoc on everyone else. He is not a mindless villain, evil for the sake of being evil. He is conflicted and had the potential to be good, which is the reason why Thor almost saves his life in the end. It's his final chance to redeem himself, and he rejects it, losing Thor's respect once and for all. Looking back through the events of the plot, we see countless moments where Loki could have woken up to the truth and defeated his misbelief, but instead he made fear-based decisions, laying the groundwork for his own destruction. Even at the end of his rope, Loki tries to save himself, but it's too late. I could have done it, father! I could have done it! For you! He can see that he's lost, and so he meets his tragic end. I know Loki's story doesn't technically end there, but it does make a complete negative character arc as far as story structure goes. But what if you want to use the negative character arc on a character who is not the antagonist? And what if you want their arc to span multiple books or seasons? That is totally possible and it can be awesome. And one of my favorite examples of this is Elizabeth from Poldark. Elizabeth's character arc is pretty dramatic. 
She goes from being the hero's love interest to being the hero's ultimate downfall, and then becomes pretty much an accomplice of the villain whose goal is to utterly destroy the hero. But let's back up to the beginning. The conflicted starting point. What does Elizabeth think will bring her true happiness or contentment? How is her desire fundamentally based on her misbelief? Elizabeth's conflicted starting point appears when we first meet her, which also happens to be the inciting incident for Ross, the protagonist of the whole story. Ross returns home to Cornwall after fighting in the Revolutionary War, only to discover that his whole family thought he died in battle. That includes his one true love, Elizabeth. While he was gone for two years, she became engaged to Ross's cousin, Francis, never expecting to see Ross again. Obviously, this new development raises a lot of eyebrows, and inner conflict. Even from this first scene with Elizabeth, we can see that she is deeply conflicted. She still loves Ross, and Ross still loves her, but she is afraid of losing the security she knows she has right now. She mistakenly believes herself to be vulnerable and helpless, and we see how strongly that lie controls her as she flounders, not knowing what to do. What shall we do? There is nothing to do. You are engaged to Francis. She's easily persuaded to believe that Ross is not the man for her, and she is much better off with Francis. In her heart, Elizabeth knows the truth, but she is afraid of being without security, support, and guidance. Her character arc poses an interesting question. Is it really better to be safe than sorry? What is the cost of indecision? First, fear-based choice. What is the impossible choice? Elizabeth must be faced with options stay inside her comfort zone and risk never getting what she desires, or venture into the unknown and accomplish her goal while still avoiding her fear. Because Elizabeth's fears hold her back, events unfold exactly as planned. She denies her heart's desire and instead chooses security. She marries Francis. It's a way to accomplish her goal while still avoiding her fear. She wants to be loved and feel secure, but doesn't want to risk losing the kind of life she is used to. Ironically, she is ruled by uncertainty almost as much as she fears uncertainty. And this fear is what keeps her from being honest with herself and with Ross. How can you come to me now and ask me things you know I can't answer? Why can't you answer? Why can't you answer? Her fear of losing security and support is also the reason for her every decision going forward. It forces her to take a back seat in her own life, instead of making courageous decisions that would bring her closer to the truth. Game-changing midpoint. What unexpected thing is going to upend Elizabeth's plan and entire life? Why does it matter and how does it change the game? There are a few game changers for Elizabeth throughout the series. The most pivotal one being when Francis unexpectedly dies. Although their marriage wasn't all sunshine and rainbows, the loss of Francis shatters Elizabeth's world. She is left feeling more alone and vulnerable than ever, which is the perfect opportunity for Ross's nemesis, George Warleggan, to move in for the kill. Blind to his real motives, Elizabeth welcomes George's attentions and eventually agrees to marry him. Her lie still rules her every decision. She sees herself as vulnerable and defenseless, and seeks out a stronger authority to resolve all her problems. Perhaps I am the wrong sort of person to be left alone. I seem to need the strength and protection only a man can give. I have agreed to marry George Warleggan. Needless to say, Ross doesn't take very kindly to the news. He may be happily married himself, but he's never been able to completely conquer his love for Elizabeth. And when he learns that she's going to marry his worst enemy, he has a few things to say about it. I oppose this marriage, Elizabeth. I'd be glad of your assurance you will not go through with it. We both know you don't love him. I love him to distraction and will marry him next month. Things get pretty heated in more ways than one, and the next morning, Elizabeth is faced with another impossible choice. Wait for Ross, her true love, or marry George and have the security and stability she feels lost without. Acceptance of lie. What makes Elizabeth embrace her lie once and for all? What dramatic action does she take to get what she wants? Ross's selfish carelessness is what forces Elizabeth to see that she can never trust him. He has taken what was not rightly his and walked away from the consequences. Why did he have to come? I hate him for it. Elizabeth believes that Ross is not on her side and never was. 
She marries George, securing her safety and social status, but at the cost of living with the enemy and losing Ross forever. As Elizabeth's character arc takes a dive, she becomes reactive and defensive, quick to decide who is her friend and who is her enemy, which plays right into George's ultimate plan to destroy Ross and alienate Elizabeth from him. All of which slowly and methodically leads Elizabeth to the tragic end. How has Elizabeth's bad decisions led her to her tragic end? How is she to blame for this whole mess? Though Elizabeth is far from happy with a villain for a husband, she gets by, distracting herself with the wealth and prestige that comes with her new life. But when George begins to seriously doubt whether his son is actually his, Elizabeth goes to great lengths to prove her faithfulness to him. Even this decision is rooted in her misbelief, her fear of losing the security and safety that she depends on. Unfortunately, this fear-based choice is her last. In the process of trying to save herself, she inadvertently causes her own tragic end. Her death is especially piteous because it's brought about by the lies she couldn't let go of, the insecurities that have haunted her since the very beginning. If you trace back through all the events of the plot, you can clearly see that she is to blame for this whole mess. How her internal confusion led to every single fear-based decision, which ultimately led her to her tragic end. Okay, boom, that's it. Two very different but very similar negative character arcs. If you want to grab the negative character arc template, including the graph I showed you earlier and all the story examples, I compiled all of that into a printable PDF and I added it to the Writer's Life Wednesday resource hub, which you can get access to when you join my Patreon at any level. So go to patreon.com slash Abby Emmons to grab that printable. And there's a bunch of other awesome writing resources on there that I think you will love. So check it out. Comment below and tell me what is your favorite example of a negative character arc. Smash that like button if you liked this video and be sure to subscribe to this channel if you haven't already because I post writing videos and publishing videos every single Wednesday. And I would love to have you here in the community. Until next week, my friend, rock on. <laughs>